without further ado, we should move on to our first live event in this EMEA time belt. I'm really excited that we can go to our global satellite event partners who are in Switzerland. They're going to take the floor for our first three sessions today. And there we'll take a deep dive into the Swiss in infrastructure for fintech and innovation in particular, everything from blockchain to sustainable finance. We'll hear opinions on how startups, big banks, and traditional financial centers have to cooperate in order to, to, to successfully drive innovation. So hopefully we can go live to Zurich in Switzerland and we can catch up with Ruth Metzler-Arnold, who is chairwoman of Switzerland Global Enterprise for some opening remarks. Ruth, it's all yours. Thank you. Dear entrepreneurs, technologists, investors, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you from Switzerland to the Swiss satellite event of the World FinTech Festival 2020. Us, that is Switzerland Global Enterprise, Switzerland official organization for export and investment promotion, and the State Secretariat for International Finance. Switzerland has been part of the Singapore FinTech Festival since 2017. Last year, we sent the largest delegation and set up the biggest country pavilion. This year, we are presenting some of the best of our technology in a virtual exhibition. As a strong financial center and technology hub, Switzerland features one of the world-leading fintech ecosystems. Rankings put Switzerland in the top five globally. Today, as part of the Economic Summit and on December 9, we want to highlight how we go about creating innovation sustainably and share some of our insights with the world on how to grow a unique place where technology in general can flourish. How does this place look like? On August 12th this year, I was climbing up to one of the globally most known and Switzerland's most attractive mountain, the Matterhorn in Zermatt. That day, a dream came true, which accompanied me since I was a little girl. I was overwhelmed when I reached the peak around 8 a.m. in the morning. Embracing the gorgeous view from the top and taking pictures, my mountain guide explained to me that Zermatt already has 5G mobile internet coverage and hence, even on 4,478 meters, the technology was readily available. The Matterhorn was part of a 5G long distance test. By the way, I learned that in addition to his occupation as a mountain and ski guide, he runs his own startups, developing apps for mountaineering and tourism. Another example, the, the ski resort Flims Lags in the Grisons offers flexible co-working spaces on 2,250 meters above sea level for techies to reach the peak of inspiration and combine that with an unmatched sports adventure. Anywhere in our country, you can find dedicated people working on innovation and state-of-the-art infrastructure. This is why Switzerland has been regularly producing world premiere in the fintech arena, for example, related to blockchain technology. In 2014, Ethereum and its cryptocurrency token, Ether, were founded in Zug. Today, it is the most common cryptocurrency and blockchain technology after Bitcoin. In 2016, Zug became the first city in the world to accept Bitcoin payments for tax purposes. In 2018, the fintech company 21 Shares, formerly known as Amune, launched the world's first crypto exchange traded products on the Swiss Stock Exchange. 
Since 2019, Switzerland has two regulated crypto banks. Bitcoin pioneers such as Xapo or Brad Wallet have moved their headquarters to Switzerland. The blockchain ecosystem prospered throughout the whole country and today there are over 840 blockchain and crypto companies. The industry employs by now more than 4,400 people and keeps on growing. Switzerland breathes and lives the fintech reality. That includes especially our business-minded public authorities. We listen to the needs of our domestic and foreign entrepreneurs with their disruptive ideas. We want our regulation to enable innovation. For example, with the sandbox regime for fintech implemented already in 2017. We offer a stable, secure and trustworthy environment with high ethical standards, being a traditionally strong financial center. And there are many other factors contributing to Switzerland's unique fintech ecosystem. I am now very happy to open the stage for our federal councillor and minister of finance, Uli Maurer, who will be followed by a panel discussion with the CEOs of our two global banks, UBS and Credit Suisse, and the president of the Swiss Bankers Association. They will share with you Switzerland's success factors to become one of the leading places for fintech in the world. I wish you now all a rewarding conference with many insights and lots of inspirations. Mr. Federal Councillor, dear Uli, the floor is yours. We have to follow our clients in their demands. And their demands are these days, um, they are driven by what they experience from the large digital companies. So they want convenience, they want, want to have first quality. And we as you know, global institutions, and that's that characterizes Swiss banks. You know, we always have been thinking in a number of currencies. We always have been thinking internationally because our home market is relatively small. So we have to go abroad. We have to understand what our clients need. We have to provide the convenience to offer what they need. And we can do that with, you know, first class and innovative products. You know, we are in Switzerland, we have among the best universities of the world, they help us to be innovative. And that is precisely what we feel internationally is required. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then Ralph Hammers, you arrived to Switzerland very recently. Welcome, by the way. Um, and based on your experience before you were at the Dutch Bank ING Group, um, I'd like for you to give us a bit of an international perspective when it comes to fintech. For instance, Heber Scheid mentioned that we need to go abroad, but what are the conditions, what are the trends abroad? <clears throat> well, I, I think fintech is nothing new, right? So uh, you saw the kind of the, um, the fintechs coming up about 10 years ago uh, on the back of the success of digital, uh, on the back of the, adapt, uh, the adaptation of mobile. And, and then digital became something that the consumer could really kind of benefit from. I think what you have seen since, uh, and, and, and uh, as a trend, uh, you saw new banks coming up, like banks completely come from scratch, clearly not having the legacy that most of the old banks have, like, like, like ours, uh, so they could move faster. Having said that, you also see that they haven't really come to fruition from a business model perspective yet. So I do think that, you know, they can be successful, but the business model, will it be sustainable over a longer time? Uh, the freemium uh, kind of approach in order to get as many clients as, as, as soon as possible to build scale, how will you make your money? So that, that's, that's one, one trend. The other trend is uh, pretty relevant actually for, for Switzerland because uh, clearly, you know, we know very well what wealth management is all about is the robo-advice trend. But even in the robo-advice trend, you see that yeah, the, those algorithms that they have come up with, uh, they are really adding value and they can uh, allocate much faster. Uh, but in the end, it's just the algorithm. Uh, you know, at the back end, you need the funds, the ETFs. And the front end, you see that there is a 
there's only a, a small uh, percentage of clients that really dare to be advised by an algorithm. So some kind of human interaction is still necessary there. And if that is the case, how can you really scale? Um, so those two, I think the, the, the jury is out. Now, to the next three, this is the way I, uh, I like to kind of uh, uh, put it, I think there is a real future. The first one is uh, digital assets and tokenization. Um, also here in Switzerland, uh, really at the forefront of that. Uh, we are really at the forefront of that. And I do think that uh, we haven't even scratched the surface of the opportunity that we see in digital assets and tokenization. But there is a lot to be done in order to make that successful in terms of laws, regulation, definitions, agreements within society, safety, security. There's a lot of, a, a, a lot of kind of conditions that you need in order to make that successful. Once you go uh, through there, uh, the potential is almost unlimited there. Uh, then uh, something that, that, that we're in Switzerland also really want to focus on is, is green fintechs. And why do I believe in green fintechs? Because it basically bangs on two trends. And, you know, if, if one trend is not enough, basically fintechs, mm -hmm. have sustainability. the green, the sustainability aspect, we know it's taking off. So you, you, I, I do think there is a, there's a real future there. And then maybe as the last, uh, the last uh, example, uh, here to stay uh, and absolutely successful going forward and certainly very disruptive for the banks is open banking. Uh, open banking mm -hmm. will uh, create the opportunity uh, for disintermediation, uh, for dashboarding as well. So for, for both corporate customers as, as well as consumers, uh, uh, being on top of your finances, being able to initiate into different banks, into different players behind that. Um, um, so that uh, will uh, certainly disintermediate on one side. And on the other side, it will also give the opportunity for many new players to come on it. Because through the open banking, they will actually have access to all of these customers. Uh, so the scaling aspect of if you're just a fintech trying to find your own customers, for example, in the payments uh, uh, space, it's difficult. It takes a long time. So you, you're probably running out of uh, money five times in, in, your, in your life. Uh, 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 but with open banking, you have access to mm -hmm. all. So those are the five trends, I would say. Uh, the first two, jury is out. The second three, uh, I think, yeah, that's real, really the future. Okay, thank you very much. We'll dig a bit deeper into that later on. Uh, now I'd like to uh, go to Thomas Gottstein. You're joining us from Singapore. Uh, first of all, what are you doing there? Uh, and <laughs> what have you seen there uh, that you think this is something you want to bring to Switzerland or any trend that impressed you? Hi, Tanya, and hi, Daniela, Herbert, and Ralph. Sorry that I cannot be there, but I'm actually excited and delighted that I can be here in Singapore. You know, when I took the CEO role on the 14th of February, I wanted to come already in March to Singapore. And ever since, it was impossible and closed for us to, to come here. But about two weeks ago, our regional head uh, managed to get an approval for me to come here. Singapore is after New York. And London, our third largest hub outside Switzerland. We have 3,800 people here. And it's extremely important for me to visit my colleagues, but also the clients here, the regulators, uh, but also uh, uh, just to feel how Asia is actually going uh, uh, in terms of business, but also how it's handling COVID-19. And it has been a fantastic few days here. Uh, I'm really uh, impressed how, how the region is coping with it. Uh, APAC is 20% of our revenue. It's very important for me to, to be here uh, several times a year. Uh, and from that perspective, it was a coincidence that uh, when I heard about uh, this uh, event that um, I'm here. So I'm delighted to join this panel from Singapore. Okay. And, and have you seen anything uh, in the fintech world in Singapore that, that you think you would like to share with us during your trip? Well, uh, already in 2015, Credit Suisse decided actually to uh, roll out our digital private bank from Singapore. So we gave actually Singapore the lead on this. 
uh, and it was a real success because uh, the whole region is very uh, digitally affine uh, and it allowed us uh, to come up with some innovations that we wouldn't have developed so quickly out of, out of Switzerland. And uh, that was a very good move, I think. So we have uh, seen some very um, promising new uh, tools that we are offering our clients, but also internally. Uh, but also, you know, uh, just uh, to see how we are dealing here with uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. it's very impressive. You know, it, the tracing really works. Uh, you come to the entrance here, uh, they take your temperature with a computer and uh, everything is done uh, really very professionally. Uh, so it's, um, it's a very digital world here. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so we have heard a few things uh, that you also mentioned, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, some factors. And uh, I would like to hear maybe the Swiss perspective on it, how these global trends that you heard now are, um, are, are um, influencing our financial center, Herbert Scheid. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I think Ralph outlined, you know, very important trends and they are global trends. So they are here in Switzerland too. Um, if I just talk about uh, tokenization, I'll take up that that um, that notion. I mean, we are here at the SIX, the Swiss Stock Exchange, and the Swiss Stock Exchange has been, you know, that is, the Swiss Stock Exchange is user-owned, user-governed. So it's something quite unique in this world. So all the banks are owners of this uh, organization here, of the Swiss Stock Exchange. And the Swiss Stock Exchange um, has a large project for the last two, two and a half years, SDX, which is precisely digging into the details of how to tokenize um, securities, shares, um, uh, real estate, art, um, and we are making huge inroads there. And it's possible because we work very closely together with the banks. Um, we um, have a close link with the regulatory um, agencies, of close links, of course, uh, with the Ministry of Finance and the, and the SIF. So, so it is a combined it's a combined exercise um, of all players involved. And I think that should give Switzerland a huge advantage in moving forward quickly uh, in that field. Let me take, a, take up another point, which um, Ralph quite rightly mentioned, and that is open, open finance and open banking. And it is very important that we open ourselves as banks to the digital world. However, it has, to, it has to go together with a regulation which regulates as well the activities and not only the institutions. So we still live in a world which, in which regulators look at banks and treat them as special entities. And the large, um, the large fintech companies, um, the large, um, the large uh, digital companies, uh, be it Google, Facebook, and all of them, they very often offer the same kind of products, but they are not regulated. So we have to come to a world where we, where we are sort of on equal footing. Otherwise, those institutions who provide security to the financial systems will be disadvantaged. And that in the long term is to the disadvantage of the whole financial center. And that is not just Switzerland, that is everywhere. So these are two remarks from a Swiss perspective, from a perspective of guaranteeing the financial security um, of Switzerland. So banks kind of feel that they have to compete without having a, a level playing field. Um, one side you have fintech that are less regulated and then the more established banks. What are your reactions to it? First of all, I was very pleased to hear uh, the comments made here in the last few minutes, which proves the fact that Switzerland is actually home to all of these activities. You know, we branch out geographically all over the world. Uh, proof is currently in Singapore. Uh, we branch out in the area of new technologies and into our common future, which is uh, sustainable growth 
above anything else. And um, as a regulator, we are making the policy framework for all of these activities. And it was said it is a un unique combination of political stability and willingness of the regulator to provide all these framework conditions. And we are not afraid. Uh, on the contrary, you know, we are looking into this intermediation very openly together also with our supervisory agency. And of course, we're also looking into uh, regulating activities instead of institutions. So this is exactly the way we're going. And um, we profit certainly from the, the, the very close relationships we have with our internationally active financial market actors. And it's not just the banks, it's also the insurances. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned, the, the stock exchange. So um, it couldn't have been said better. And for us, it is really only a matter of bringing the ideas together and putting them into a fruitful future, which is, I have to say, also easily done these days with our parliament. You know, you could have the impression that in a direct democracy, you are slow and you're maybe complicated. The opposite is true. We are very innovative and we have a, a strong following among also the politicians to, to go that way. And Switzerland wants to keep on you want to add something? Sorry. No, I, I, well, I, I just want to subscribe. I, so I've been here now for four months and uh, there's a couple of uh, um, kind of conditions uh, that I see here that uh, will uh, make us successful, uh, continue to be successful. So the first one is indeed, it's all about regulations. Is there appetite to change uh, elements of laws and regulations? It's not like uh, I want one new law for digital commerce or whatsoever. That's not how it works. It is about, you know, moving up in society and, and ensuring that society from all of its aspects and all of its interaction can become more and more digital. And therefore, it, it, it's not one law. It is about small changes in many different aspects of law. So that, that's one condition that you need to have in order to be successful. Uh, and I see the appetite there and the support there in, in our conversations. The second one is the sheer infrastructure that you need to be able to kind of have any success in, in a digital world. And that's that's right here, right? So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. six, but it's also just, you know, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the total infrastructure. And the third one is, is the availability of talent. You know, mm -hmm. universities, the attractiveness of, this, of the country to come to, uh, because you need to bring the talent together to innovate. I mean, nobody innovates uh, by himself or, or by herself. Uh, innovation, certainly these days, is about openly sharing your ideas, openly failing on on first steps. It's all about it's all about you know those concepts. For which you have to bring people together, mm -hmm. and you see it happening right here as well. And uh, so I think there's many ingredients. And if you if you then combine that with, and maybe you don't see that because you're most of you are Swiss, but I can see it coming from outside. Mm -hmm. Switzerland is a brand in itself. Right. I mean, you take it all for granted, maybe, but this country stands for something. It stands for that stability, for that security, uh, for the trust, uh, for banking, uh, for uh, wealth management, for innovation in, in many industries, innovation in many industries. So it stands already for something, Switzerland. Okay. Yeah. Um, everyone is smiling. <laughs> yeah, but it's, yeah. yeah, well, it's the point, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if you live here, it's like, okay, yeah, well, this may not go fast or that could be fast. Of course, we can all improve. But don't mistake how the world is looking at Switzerland. And, and it's a brand in itself. No, I agree. And, and uh, I mean, Switzerland has the ideal framework for, uh, for fintechs to strive. As you mentioned, uh, universities, um, uh, you have venture cap access to venture capitals to, to, to drive innovation, um, a strong financial um, industry. So, nevertheless, uh, however, I think there's just, to my knowledge, one uh, fintech unicorn so far coming from Switzerland. So, I wonder what uh, are the barriers that we still are trying to break down also because uh, Federal Council would Maurer said that digitalization requires innovation-friendly legal framework conditions and that he wants to fight for as little barriers as possible. So what barriers are we still talking about that we're trying to tackle? Well, there is always the question of size and uh, market access and scalability of your ideas. And 
I don't know if it is really, I mean, it is, of course, important to all those who um, create a startup to one day become a unicorn, of course. But the the knowledge and the path that leads to, to that result are just as important. And I think we have uh, an extremely um, helpful environment for, for startups themselves. You know, they, they get the talent, they get the, I think, the legal and also the tax side is, is very favorable. And uh, we then have to be able to help help them access the market. It can be a multiplier, like a big bank, taking up the idea. And um, certainly these days and in the future, uh, we have to work, and not just Switzerland, I think, in Europe and globally, to actually open markets, especially to good ideas. Switzerland is a very open market itself. We do not put any impediments to uh, incoming, uh, for example, fintech ideas. So um, there's that's a lot to profit for the customers if you could work uh, on this aspect. Thomas Gottstein, is there anything you would like to add to what you just heard? <laughs> no, I think it was uh, well summarized by everybody in the room. Uh, fintechs are very important. They, I don't see them actually as, uh, uh, as com competitors, more as partners in many cases. Uh, you know, sometimes they are disruptive, but in many cases, fintechs are actually... Uh, partners of us, we work with them. We could never develop all ourselves. So, um, and and uh, we have we have Swiss fintechs, but we have also other fintechs that we work with. Okay, I think I have some comments here on this side. Yeah. So, uh, just to kind of, uh, as, as this is an open discussion, right? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, on on the point of scalability and and making uh, and supporting fintechs to be successful here in a digital world. The digital world uh, starts and stops and the scalability of the digital world starts and stops with the availability of an uh, e-identity right and we know we have a referendum coming uh, coming up for that uh, but it's a crucial element to see whether you can actually scale <laughs> because one of the big hurdles for many of the at least you know the, the fintechs that go to consumers um, one of the big hurdles there in order to come to uh, scalability quickly is the e-identity. Uh, one of the hurdles to, <coughs> to, uh, uh, to accelerate the digital economy in, 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 you know, in, in, in all of its facets, which is ever so important given what we have experienced just in COVID, uh, because that is the alternative uh, way for us if we can't physically interact as, as much anymore there has to be this, this this digital world out there that can supply uh, and, and the services and the goods that, that you need. Digital identity, e-identity is a core element there in order to be successful. So that could help us once we get there in Switzerland. Uh, and it could help the, the, the fintech community to grow faster. Mm -hmm. Have a shot. I want to <clears throat> expand on the very important argument of State Secretary Stottle. Uh, it's scalability. It's interesting, we visited a few years ago Israel, and you know, Israel is highly digital and extremely in the forefront. And they say in the second or the third phase, they have to go out. They go to the states. Mm -hmm. So it, it, under, it underlines the importance of scalability. A lot of fintechs so far, I mean, if you look at the digital transformation, you have to see it in, in, in kind of echelons. Um, you know, we are at the moment at a stage where uh, digital transformation is particularly strong in the field of payment, of the payment sector, because it's a huge sector. Yeah. Switzerland is first class in payment, but it is even better in wealth management, in asset management. There we have a long tradition. Switzerland is host to more than 25% of all cross-border assets. So when it comes to digital development in the field of wealth management and asset management, I'm sure we are going to have a lot to offer. And that is not so well known yet in the world. And I think it is up us to, up to bring that out. And I think we are in a very good way for that. Thank you. Um, Thomas Gottstein, you mentioned before that uh, you don't see fintech as competition, but rather partners. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, um, fintech teams often also have a tech team, a, a team with a tech background. And uh, so I wonder what can banks bring to this collaboration? How do you collaborate with fintechs? One of my colleagues once said, a bank these days is a tech company with a banking license. And that's basically how you have to think about it. Technology is 
part of uh, almost all our front to back processes, whether it's client facing, whether it's uh, between the relationship manager and uh, the second line of defense, whether it's in the processing side, on the operation side. So technology is part of us and um, many of the fintech um, entrepreneurs actually come from banks, from large banks and uh, where they have learned the trade and they come with ideas and sometimes they get frustrated because things go a bit slower with large banks and then they go there. But we have also learned from them, uh, you have to be agile, you have to uh, develop uh, new uh, tools with our online banking, for example, in Switzerland, we sit down constantly. We have a client experience lab. They come to our office. They say they don't like this. They would like to do more trading in options or they would like to do uh, more uh, investments in ESG products or whatever. And so we work with them in develop constantly developing our, our tools. And that, we have learned that also from fintechs because they are much more agile. They're much more... Uh, uh, quicker and for example here in in, in asia we um, we developed uh, abilities for clients to place their order via wechat and via uh, uh, snapchat and and that that is more and more happening so uh, we, we need to we need to involve uh, new technologies in the way we interact with our clients and um, and therefore you cannot you cannot say this is uh, you know the large banks and this is old technology and this is fintech uh, because it really comes together. Okay, so you actually gave a perfect example of how uh, you're listening to clients and Herbert Schad, you mentioned in your very first uh, comment that uh, you have to listen to clients. So I wonder how else do you listen to clients? How else do you figure out where where what they want? where the needs are? Well, of course, you know, you get a lot of data and, you know, banks are hosting a lot of data and we have a lot of data from all our clients. We deal with it with great care, um, but we use it in order to understand how our clients act, what they require at what stage. And using, you know, being a data-driven company helps you to understand your clients. And then, of course, that has to be, that has to be supplemented with direct contact. Um, as Ralph so rightly says, you know, it's not only good enough to rely on, on algorithms. You have to mix and, you know, to have a hybrid kind of relationship based on data and of human interaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, um, I mean, banks, you all sell uh, financial services and with digitalization speeding up also this year with COVID-19, the contact with your clients was uh, accelerated into the digital uh, sphere. But I would say that's your bread and butter, the, cl the, the contact with the client. So how are you dealing with that now during this year? How was it? What are the findings? Where do you want to go when it comes to having direct client contact? Actually, I, you know, from what I know, it came pretty natural. Uh, everybody, everything was there with both the customers and, uh, and ourselves and, and, and all banks. Uh, um, basically provided for a very stable uh, infrastructure. So operationally, uh, we were all very resilient. And the availability to have the video connection was there. Uh, our staff could work from home very quickly. Uh, completely, uh, you know, supported with technology. Um, so I, I think it was almost natural. And a lot of the moves that we were about to take as players, but never dared to take, we were now forced to take. And, uh, and basically, we got the proof of being right without daring to move there faster. Uh, and I think that is that is what happened uh, during COVID in, in anything, whether it is the video connection, whether it is the app usage and the digital services that you give there as well. It's all been there, but forcing customers to use more of it, we felt uh, was not the way to go. But COVID basically gave that as the only opportunity for many customers now to interact with the, cust with, with the bank and therefore adopt it. Uh, their behavior uh, and adopted these channels and adapted their behavior in order to uh, to to work with the bank. So that's 
that's how you do it. Uh, and, and maybe to come back on, on, on how do you then listen to your clients because you can't bring them into your lab. Then, for example, as uh, Thomas was indicating, that clearly you would love to do that, but, but, but you can't in this way because you can't have the physical uh, interaction. Um, honestly, if, if you work fully agile, you change your app about every week. <laughs> and if, if, if elements of your app are not being used, clearly your clients don't like it. So you take them out again. Mm -hmm. And this is all about, you know, the whole, the whole culture about, you know, trying, failing fast, dialing back, trying, failing fast, dialing back. That's how you listen to your customers. It's amazing how much interaction you have with your customers. You have millions of contacts a day with your customers because people make payments mm -hmm. every day. So the use of the app, and the way the routing of the app works or the services that are on the app or the products to be bought on the app, that is all an indication of what clients like or don't like. You don't have to interview them. Mm -hmm. It's live. Yeah. yeah. yeah? You have so if they don't do something, they don't like it. And then you try something new and they use it, mm -hmm. they like it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's much more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Anything anyone wants to add to that? Well, I think, you know, what COVID, COVID has created a lot of problems, but it has helped digitalization to move forward. It was really a catalyst, as, as Ralph says. And it, has, it will force all the banking industry, the Swiss banks, to really think more digitally because we have to deliver the same level of service as, as, um, uh, as digital providers do. And we probably, our clients, that was, that was a study made by McKinsey. Um, McKinsey estimates that, you know, our clients have jumped forward by three years in the use of digital tools. Yep. Yep. And that means we have to quickly jump, <laughs> jump with them. Yep. And, and, and that, is the task, that is the task we are having ahead of us. Mm -hmm. But as Ralph says, we are very well equipped. We have coped excellently with you know, the new situation. Um, we had all conferences with clients, webinars, you know, 300 participating, interacting without being informed about what's happening around Corona, what's happening around the capital markets, what's happening individually with them. So I think, you know, we are on a very good path, but we know we have to move forward with a, with a big speed. Okay, I'm coming with a more specific question, um, as this is the uh, Singapore FinTech uh, Festival, um, because they uh, are working on standardizing data exchange between banks so that individual customers can get their data from multiple financial institutions in a single place and to make appropriate uh, financial decisions, so kind of an aggregator. Um, I'm just with this idea, is this something that we would see in Switzerland in the near future? I mean, data exchange is not a one-way thing, so it needs two to tango. So you need to have the necessary reg regulatory framework also in, in your partner country to, to be able to do that. And uh, in, especially in the case of Singapore, but on a, on a general basis, we're in Switzerland certainly looking into the pros and cons. And if I may add to what you said about the EID and what we learned about COVID, I think what we learned is that Basically, in Switzerland, your, your Hoover, your vacuum cleaner, knows more about your habits and you <laughs> allow it to know it, uh, but not your, your government that tries to protect you from a, um, a pandemic. So uh, this interface between the use of data, you giving away your data Amazing. for free in many business models, so you just, or you just see the consumption side of things. And on the other hand, the tremendous uh, impact it could have if you could use data in a protected way and also yeah. let the customer own its own data. I think there we have a comparative advantage over those regulators or who just, um, you know, create an open space and everything's out in the open and you're a transparent individual. Transparent not just to your vacuum cleaner, but to the whole society yeah. that uses uh, the, the internet and, and all the, the apps. Yeah. So there I think we have to think clearly and COVID gave us an incentive to do so. How could we use technology in an advantageous way so that both sides of the, of the deal mm -hmm. get something out of it? Yeah. And this Thank applies for all our financial services in Switzerland. It goes way beyond uh, uh, data connectivity agreement. Okay. Thank you very much. We have uh, 
two, three minutes left. So I just want to leave everyone uh, for a last comment uh, to anything you heard or something you, questions that you're thinking about for 2021. Who wants to go first? Well, I can go first. Yeah. I think, you know, I want to sort of put on and sort of underline what state security Stefan says. We have to protect data. It's fine to open everything up, but data is private. And we have, you know, our clients have a right to demand, you know, their own, to, to determine what is happening with their data. That's point number one. Point number two is it's fantastic to move forward digitally. We have to be aware of, of uh, cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So cybersecurity will be equally important as all the other things we are talking about. So that will be a concern for 21, which we have mm -hmm. to address. Thank you very much, uh, Ralf Hammers. Yeah, so to, to add, so cybersecurity is certainly one. Uh, the more digital the society becomes, the more important these services become. Therefore, the more interesting services, not only financial services, but any kind of day-to-day -day services, utility services, whether it is power supply, uh, air traffic control, whatever, you know, everything that's crucial to be safe in, in, in a society will be uh, much more the subject of cyber attacks. And for that, you know, there is no institution that can do that alone. So that needs a real concerted effort and open communication between institutions across sectors and with government uh, uh, there as well. So cybersecurity is one, and you see it, you see it actually on the, on the rise uh, anyway. Maybe the second one is that um, um, innovation is, 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 is not this thing that we can determine to be this, uh, uh, basically a trend. It is here to stay. Uh, banks and companies have to embrace the digital future. Uh, for that, you should realize that you can't innovate alone. I mean, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. Um, and therefore, you have to be open which specifically for banks is, is not the easiest, right? Because we have to be careful as to how open we can be in that. But nevertheless, if you want to innovate, uh, uh, you have to be open. Uh, therefore, you know what, just to add to, uh, to uh, what uh, Thomas said, uh, the, the symbiotic relationship with fintechs is right there that, that can help us. And the fintechs are the youngsters, they are fast, they are innovative, and the banks have the brand and have the scale. And it's that symbiotic relationship, I think that we can work on even more so, uh, uh, ensuring safety around data and, and security. Thank you very much. And the last word goes to you, Thomas Kotstein. Uh, I uh, agree that um, especially around cyber, we need a lot of uh, collaboration because I think it's one of the biggest risks we have as an industry. So that certainly one one element that I would also fully subscribe to what Ralf said, and the other the other uh, given that I'm already now in in Singapore, it's uh, almost uh, an obvious one. But the collaboration across uh, regions and to learn from each other uh, is very important. So I think uh, there's a lot of things we can learn also in Asia, uh, and we should be open to to new solutions. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists for those insightful comments.